Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister, how are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very well, thank you. How are you? Alhamdulillah, good. Thank you very much, sister, for joining us today on the Naqabi Diaries. Sister, could you please introduce yourself for us and tell us a bit about what you do? Um, okay, my name is uh, Peter Stewart, um, or my name after I became Muslim is Nastura, um, but I still go legally by my um, original name. Um, what do I do? I'm studying. Uh, I'm, I'm, an online, I'm an online student, so I'm still studying, even in the lockdown. <laughs> what are you studying? Um, I'm studying? I'm studying digital design. Okay. Um, and then I do some part, part-time work. So I'm not just studying part-time and part-time work. I'm, I have two children. I'm looking mm-hmm. after at home. And I, I used to you know, teach people how to drive. Ladies here, I'm living oh, in okay. So I'm In Saudi? Helping, I'm living in Saudi Arabia. So I'm helping ladies to get on the road. <laughs> oh, right. So has the, have they Saudi changed Arabia. the rules now? I'm a bit behind. Yeah, you're, you're about a year behind. Okay, alhamdulillah. Okay. <laughs> Ladies have been driving over here for, um, yeah, for one year. Okay, alhamdulillah, have, that's um, good. They've opened the system, they've set up a few schools around the place, but those schools um, are packed. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm just doing freelance. Okay. Uh, freelance, you know, teaching people to drive. Just um, casual jobs, picking up work here and there. Alhamdulillah, great. Cool. Okay, sister, so um, you mentioned that um, you have uh obviously you use you have a muslim name so that means that you must be a revert so could you let us know a little bit about how you came to islam uh it's a really long story but i'll try to keep it as brief as i can yeah, take your time as much um, just leave make sure you give us all yeah. the juicy bits inshallah okay well if you feel that i'm missing out on any juicy bits <laughs> please feel free to ask um okay well i suppose you know i used to be an atheist mm-hmm. Um, in my childhood, um, I grew up uh, with my parents as an atheist. When I was very young, my grandparents were Christian, mm-hmm. so they encouraged me. You know, they encouraged me to attend church with them. I used to go to church with them. I learned about the stories of the prophets. Um, but then, when I grew up, I went into the church, and they they tried to say that you know Jesus was God, mm-hmm. and in my heart, I rejected that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they were reading from the Bible and then explaining you know, the verses. And I felt in my heart that they were changing the meaning. So I left the church. I didn't go back. Um, my parents said there's no God. So I just lived my life as though there was no God. So how old was you? Um, I would have been about 10 years old. Okay. Going to the church um, uh, approximately. And then so, you know, most of my life I, I lived, you know, not believing in God, not really thinking about it too much until one day um, I, I was working as a manager for a hotel. I worked in many hotels in the you know, alcohol industry. Mm-hmm. And one day I was riding my motorbike on the way to work and I was speeding. <laughs> the policeman, you know, gave me a fine, pulled me over. Uh, I was a bit upset about that. Uh, on the way to after arriving at work um, at, at about lunchtime, I had to go and do the banking. So I jumped on my bike to go and do the banking, and then I remembered my ticket. And then on the way, um, I, I slowed down after remembering my ticket, and then just about two seconds after slowing down, this car pulled out over a double lane, crossed my path, and missed me by, by about an inch. I ended up slamming slamming on my brakes doing an emergency brake until I was mm. actually stand still in the middle of the road on my bike. I was very shocked and uh, shaken up from the incident. And then I started to think, if I didn't get that fine in the morning, I would have been dead that day. So mm. I started to think, you know, that there's something out there protecting me. Um, after some time, I, I travelled and uh, I met some people, um, asked some questions. And... You know, I just, but all this time, I just had this feeling that there was something protecting me. So that made me, you know, look into, you know, different religions and, and different beliefs. I didn't know too much about, you know, Islam. So you never met any Muslims? Of, I remember a couple of incidents I, from my past before traveling. I remember seeing a lady and thinking, why she got that thing on her head? <laughs> and I used to work as a checkout before I was, um, 
started in the hotel. I used to work at a, in a, at a checkout check in Woolworth, one of the supermarkets there. And then one guy, he came through. I'm a very friendly person. So I expect, you know, the people facing me to be very friendly mm. know, as well. And one guy came through this uh, checkout and he just kept looking down and he didn't greet me and he didn't talk to me. Uh, and I, I thought he was really strange. Um, afterwards, looking back, I see that he was just being really respectful to me. Mm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I didn't know anything about Islam. So then I travelled. Um, the, the first time I was introduced to Islam, I was working for a disabled gentleman and he was reading a book. And I asked him, oh, can you, what are you reading? And, you know, just for conversation. So he told me that he was reading about this uh, book where this Iraqi woman was bashing, this Iraqi woman was bashed by her husband. Oh, and, domestic and, um, abuse. Said, yeah, and, and he said, oh, she's a Muslim. Uh, and I said, um, what's that? I didn't know what a Muslim was. Mm. And he said, her religion is Islam. Well, that didn't teach me anything. I said, what's that? <laughs> So we took out the encyclopedia and it said that there was this man, Muhammad, who wrote a book and, um, um, and started, and he, he began this religion. And so I thought, oh, now I forgive me, I thought, oh, this crazy guy, I'm going to go and write my own book, mm. uh, which of course I, I never did. <laughs> uh, and then later on, I travelled again to another area and then some gentleman he's talking about islam and he's saying oh those muslim men they have a good they can marry four wives i don't wow. know anything about islam at this stage except that muslim men seem to bash their women and marry four of them wow. <laughs> so i kept traveling i traveled through malaysia and in the indonesia while traveling through malaysia and indonesia um, of course i'm being muslim countries i'm exposed more and more to islam uh, they don't eat pork, they don't drink alcohol, um, they're covering some of them um, uh, and I kept travelling. Anyway, I travelled to this place, it was a beautiful place, Denotoba, spent some time there with some friends uh, and then left by myself and made my way back to the Malaysian airport where mm -hmm. I flew in from Australia. Um, made my way back to the Malaysian airport, by the time I got there I was down to $20. Right. And okay. then um, I think I have got no money, got to go home. <laughs> um, I can get help when I'm back in Australia because of the social security system over there. So I, I tried to change my ticket and the lady at the counter, she said, uh, your next flight is going to be in four days. Wow. $20 <laughs> in four days. That's not going to help me at all. Mm. <laughs> So I said, okay, the next city, any city in Australia. She said, okay, there's one leaving today. Um, I said, yes, I want it. She said, that will be an extra $100, thank you. I, said, I, I begged her. Wow. <laughs> I literally begged her. But she would have none of it. So I had nothing else to do. Let's go and find a seat for four days. <laughs> oh, no, no. $20, I thought. I was doing my calculations. Okay. But um, maybe coffee and some brownies from McDonald's once every day oh, and fill up with water in the bathroom. Oh, no, no. Okay, I'm going to survive, no problem. <laughs> I won't die. <laughs> well, anyway, so I, I made my way out to, to the waiting area and funnily enough, there was another lady that was also out there and she was also stranded. Her situ situation was worse than mine though. She had uh, no money, no friends. She'd been kicked out of the house by her husband. Um, but it was really strange that I saw these uh, workers bringing her food um, and after a day, they found her work, they found her house, they set her up. Oh, wow, uh, so I thought, sure. okay, you know, this is, from, this is from God. This is from God. I had started believing in God by that stage, you know. So I thought that this, you know, this was from God and, and he's protecting her and he'll protect me. Um, and then I, I think after staying there for one night, um, I, I met somebody and he said, you know, come along, I'll help you out. And then he took me back to his uh, friend's apartment. And um, yes, yeah, so I spent some time there in Malaysia mm. and uh, I learned a little bit of Islam off them, but they weren't practicing Muslim. Yeah. And they were more interested in what I was doing than what they were doing. Mm. But one thing that really intrigued me um, was that they said that God is one 
And now I had always rejected from the beginning. I have rejected worshipping anything or anyone except God. Mm. To me, God is, um, you know, he's great and he's the creator and nobody within this creation could possibly be, you know, God. So, um, so that he said that, it really, you know, it really stuck with me. Yeah, one God, yeah, that's right. And then he also explained about the prayer and that they don't pray and, you know, different aspects of the religion which they weren't really applying. Mm. Um, so I ended up staying there for some time. Um, they invited me to stay, so I stayed for a while, but then I moved on. Um, I moved on after that. I, I found a, an apartment as the lady. By this stage, I was really, I, I forgot about my dream at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> to go back and start again. <laughs> My dream while I was at the airport, I was sleeping at the airport. I saw a dream of myself, a vision. I saw myself wearing a scarf and speaking a different language. I understood that that was a message from God. That's what I thought, that this is a message from God, that he wants me to become Muslim. So I took that as, uh, as guidance and, mm. and, um, and took it from there. So I started asking people about becoming Muslim. Um, this lady, I, I stayed in this apartment with this lady and some other people. And she was a Christian that had become Muslim, so she's telling me about this course that she did. Mm. So I said, oh, I'm not really interested in the course. I just want to become Muslim. So all this time you're still in Malaysia? <laughs> um, all yeah, in Malaysia. I stayed in Malaysia for about eight months. Altogether. Wow. So you did it. So you, after wanting to go back to Australia and waiting I for that four-day flight, subhanAllah. Yeah, no, I ended up. Saying I, in the meantime, I had um, asked my father to send me some money. Some money. Mm. So I was able to, you know, make my way around. Um, and then what happened? Yes, yeah, so I was staying in the apartment with her. She was showing me all these movies, Jesus of Nazareth, and all the women in there were wearing scarves like the Muslims. Um, that was really interesting. Mm. Um, um, I had also met one gentleman in a restaurant talking to him about Islam and he said if you need help converting let me know and so one day I went back and I spoke to him and said you know, I want to become Muslim uh, and then he arranged for me and we went to uh, there was an aqika um, okay. there was uh, an aqika and uh, at the aqika there was a huge gathering of maybe about a hundred people um, and a sheikh was invited. The mm. sheikh came up, shaved the baby's head, gave it some tamur, mm. some date, and read some dua, and then called me forward and asked me to, you know, informed me about the six pillars of Iman, the five pillars of Islam. Um, I'm agreeing with most of it. Yes, yes, no, okay, mm. okay, maybe, yeah, no problem, because my knowledge was so limited. Mm. Uh, and then he said, okay, I took the shahada with him. And then he said, okay, what name would you like? So I had been out in town before with some friends and they said Masura. I mm -hmm. said Masura. He kept correcting me. Um, turns out that um, he knew things which I didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I accepted the name that he gave me and I'm still very happy with that until this day. And then I was so happy. I wanted to thank this man in, in the, <laughs> that had arranged for me to come so I went to go and give him a big hug oh. so, yeah. <laughs> he, oh, no. he, he saw what was happening so he, he knowingly intercepted me and encouraged me to go and greet the woman and by that time I had realized okay yeah that's the men's section that's the women's section I'm a woman I should go with the women yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of my funny moments yeah and, um, yeah, they were really great. They gave me a translation of the Quran and some clothes, things to get me going. Went and uh, took my ablution, um, gave me hijab, and I started wearing hijab, uh, just covering my hair mm -hmm. uh, from, from that day. And it was, uh, it was amazing. And okay. I've been learning. I, I knew absolutely nothing in the beginning. But mm. The more I'm still learning today, and the more I learn, the more I love my religion. Yeah, alhamdulillah. It's beautiful, isn't it? Subhanallah. So when you, when you started wearing the hijab, the headscarf, like how did that feel in the beginning? Oh, I cried. 
I yeah. was so happy. Yeah, I, I felt that it was just such, um, you know, it was such a merciful thing. Mm. I had spent my whole life half naked, let's say. Mm. Um, and, you know, it really disturbed me. Most of the time I would wear baggy pants and a baggy top and because I just don't want people staring at me. Mm. I just want to feel, you know, I, want my, I want freedom. I, I don't want this harassment. This, mm. Uh, it's really strange. Uh, and I remember thinking even before I became Muslim, you know, like I was wearing a, a short dress one time and there's this old man and he's just staring at me and disgusting the way he was staring at me. Mm. And I'm thinking, is this what God wants? Like, does God like for me to wear these types of clothes? I had asked myself, I had asked myself all these questions um, about, you know, drinking, smoking, drugs, clothes, um, so when I, when I wore the hijab the first day, even though I was in Malaysia, um, I, I felt I wasn't being stared at. Okay. I, I felt it, it was like a, I can't really explain it, but it's like a, ty a type of freedom. Mm. You know, I had, I had this freedom now. I had a, before like the eyes were on you, the pressures on you, everything. And now I had this, I had this freedom and I felt that it was so merciful that I just cried. I just cried because I felt this, this mercy in, in me and I've been grateful ever since that uh, not a day has gone past that I haven't worn the hijab since then. Allah. So from the hijab, how did you transition into wearing the niqab then? Yeah, okay, so being in Malaysia and I suppose some of the people that I was connected to, I found lots of people like mm, questioning and asking me and encouraging to wear the niqab. Okay. Some people saying you have to, some people saying you know, it's obligatory and some people saying um, no, don't do it. <laughs> so I found all of this conflict and as a new Muslim, mm -hmm. it's quite, not just uh, uh, with regard to the niqab, but many issues. Yeah. You have people, oh, I'm following this sheikh, I'm following this person, I'm following mm -hmm. this person. Yep. Oh, what are you talking about? I just want to follow my, my messenger. Yeah, God's subhanAllah. Messenger. I just want to follow God's messenger. I don't want to follow you know, like this person, because, you know, like God sent his messenger for me to follow. That's enough for me. Yeah. So, and Alhamdulillah, I moved in also with people who were very knowledgeable. So I was able to ask questions and get sound knowledge. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Um, so this is one of the issues. So I tried to wear the niqab, you know, several times um, before actually making a firm commitment because mm. it wasn't based on knowledge. It was just based on... Um, you know, hearing what people say without really looking into the issue myself. Okay. So, and then um, after I came back to Australia, uh, after about eight months, um, my parents, of course, were very shocked that I became Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> and then after about a year, after doing lots of research and asking lots of questions, I decided that um, wearing the niqab was the preferable thing to do. Mm. Why? Because I'm a female and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu oh, he's not a female. So while I can take many of the religious guidance from him, um, there are some female matters which I need to look to, you know, female mm -hmm. um, to learn my religion. So who is the best if I, you know, to what extent do I want to practice my religion? Um, you know, I should look to you know the closest and best people that, that were with him, and they were his wives, mm. and they all covered their face. And um, and many of the scholars also, you know, they bring the two verses where um, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is telling the wives of the messenger and the believers to cover yes. themselves. So how can that not be, you know, one thing for the wives and one thing for the believers. Mm. And uh, another thing is that we have uh, sometimes in us jealousy. Mm. Jealousy for someone that is better than us. Mm. Now, I'm not a good person. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I have many mistakes and I'm very weak in, in many areas. But sometimes Allah gives us strength in an area. Mm. So, uh, you know, like this is just one thing that I love to do and I feel that, you know, like it, 
it, it draws me closer and I've found so many benefits after. So seeing that the wives of the messenger and the, the closest believers around at that time, they were all covering their faith. So I, I feel that, you know, this, in the beginning, I felt that this is something that, you know, like I really want to do because I want to try to be as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and what he loves as possible. Um, and, and later on, I also, I also adopted the opinion that it actually is um, obligatory according to a woman's circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to say a new Muslim should cover her face. Mm -hmm. I believe that she has to live in, this, in, in circumstances, you know, according to her environment. And women need to go out and work and live in that environment. However, if somebody is married and, and there is no, you know, restrictions for them, then, yeah, I, I do believe that women should cover their face. Alhamdulillah. So did you find it easy to wear it based on what you said? I mean, how did your parents take it when you moved back to Australia and you did your year's worth of research and everything? When you started covering your face, how was that for your parents? Yeah, well, I was in Australia at the time when I decided to cover my face. Mm -hmm. And um, no, it wasn't very easy for my parents. Um, my mother cried. Oh, <laughs> she said, oh, I've, lost, I've lost my daughter. So oh, that was it. My covering my face was meant I was dead to her. Oh. She's, um, I've been Muslim many years now. She has changed over the years and matured. Come to do that. Um, and accepting, you know, that people yeah. choose to follow different paths. So, you know, she's wonderful now. Come to that. Um, and, um, the, you know, sometimes my family ridicule me, of course. You know, people in society ridicule mm. me. Um, you know, I, I have my, it's, I, I know in the society that I live in, when I'm in Australia, that it's accepted. When I'm here in Saudi Arabia, nobody looks the other way. Yeah. But when I'm in Australia, it is something strange. They're not, they're not used to seeing that. Mm. Okay, I don't blame them for that. And they, they don't have knowledge. It's only their reaction is based on ignorance. Yeah. I only had one really bad incident. One day I forgot to say my you're out when leaving the house. Mm. And I was with my mum and we went to the local supermarket and one lady, she came up and she, she was a mother of three children. Her children were right next to her. Mm. Um, she's a Christian. She sends them to a, um, a private Christian school. Mm -hmm. She sends them to a private Christian school paying excessive amounts of money for the education. So I was very shocked by her behaviour. She came up to me swearing, mm -hmm. carrying on, telling me to go back to my own country. Uh, you know, the script. <laughs> it seems to be the script. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was really shocked that she was behaving like that in front of her young children. Wow. Terrible of manners. A Catholic, of, a Catholic, um, of a Catholic school. Mm. Um, and then I thought, okay, my mum's going to give me a, you know, have to give me a, uh, of course, I'm, I'm not quiet when these things happen. I'm like, well, you know, she looked like she was Italian or something. I said, I'm from Australia. Where are you from? Um, and I said, it came this, um, you know, a little, uh, uh, a short dialogue mm -hmm. between us. Um, and then I, you know, just, you know, left. Okay, she, you know, her to her way and me to my way. So then I, I waited for my mother mm -hmm. <laughs> for her response by the time we got home. And... I was surprised. It was nice, my mother's response. She said, and this is after years of, you know, getting used to me wearing, you know, covering mm -hmm. my face. She said, uh, I, really, I, I wish I had have responded to the lady. Mm. She said, I wish I had have said to her, I want to see you in 10 years' time when one of your, when one of your daughters is on drugs, one of them becomes gay and one of them becomes Muslim. Oh, I want wow. to see you. <laughs> But this is life. People choose yeah. different paths. Subhanallah. Um, so, yeah, that, that was my, I think my mum, she's maybe been through a lot that she feels. <laughs> Subhanallah. So, that was really interesting, her response. And, but, um, you know, I have also, I have also had people come up and, and say to me, you know, like they look past, they look past the, the appearance. And they come up to me and say, look, I really appreciate you. I appreciate how you're trying to educate your daughters. And mm. they can see that I'm trying to be um, a good person. Yeah. So, you know, I'm only trying to be the, the, the best Muslim I can be. And that, that's to have the best character that I can have. Alhamdulillah. So how did you... I mean, 
sister. So how, how did you come to be living in Saudi Arabia? Uh, okay, after about a year, just after I started wearing niqab, actually, I was mm -hmm. informed that there is one um, scholar from Saudi Arabia who's mm -hmm. looking to get married. Okay. And, um, yeah, so it was arranged. <laughs> come to the law. Great. MashaAllah. So how long have you been living out there? Um, I've been back to Australia several times. So I travelled back and forth a little mm -hmm. bit. But um, I've probably about 15 years here altogether. Subhanallah, that's amazing. Wow. So, like, obviously, like, being um, a Reva and living in Saudi, how did you find, like, the cultural difference? Did you, do you, I'm assuming that you preferred Saudi because of the ease of being able to practice your religion freely. But as an Australian and somebody who's used to particular things, like, culturally, how did you find that cultural difference? Yeah, um, and I thought that it's, it's going to, there's cultural difference, whether it's here or it's there, um, in any place. Different people from all over the world have their different cultures. Mm. Malaysia, there was had a very strong culture in Indonesia. And so, and I had to, because I had travelled a little bit and I got to know different people from different backgrounds, so it wasn't too much of a big deal. Mm -hmm. There are tests here. It is very difficult. It was very difficult sometimes. Um, it felt sometimes lonely being at home, not being able to drive, not being able to go to places. Um, now, of course, that, that's changed to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, the way I see it is this life is a test. Yeah, I of course. It's just wherever we are. Okay, if I go to Australia, my test is my religion. Mm -hmm. When I'm here, okay, my religion's easy. But mm -hmm. my test is maybe the people, maybe the mm -hmm. system, maybe the environment, maybe family, maybe in-laws. Mm. children whatever there will always be a test so yeah we just need to we just need to be patient let's try to do what pleases our in every situation yeah alhamdulillah so what's what's been your experience so far i mean you say you travel back and forth often um to australia so like what's your experience with traveling on the plane and things like that when the niqab it's been sometimes humorous uh, and sometimes it's been you know, a pleasant experience. Okay. So can, um, can you share one pleasant and one humorous for us? Yeah. One, I was traveling, both of them I was traveling from Australia. These are both eventful. Um, um, uh, both these times. Okay. One time I was traveling from Australia and the lady Okay, she spotted me and she said, oh, we're going to check you. <laughs> so she's giving me the full pat down at the mm -hmm. airport. And I, I'm sorry, I just have to make fun of every situation. So I mm -hmm. said, well, look, free message before I fly. MashaAllah. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure. I don't know if that's because of my religion, the way I look or what have you. And another time, um, in, was it the last time I came back, was a really, um, it was a really nice experience. So I'm coming through the lady in the counter, at the counter coming mm -hmm. through uh, immigration on the way out. She saw me. She spotted me as soon as I've come in the room. She's pretty much directly come straight up to me and said, um, would you like to come over to the side to do your screening? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, okay, thank you very much. So I got to skip the whole queue. I'm <laughs> given <that>. priority. <laughs> Um, priority screening on the side um, and so that, that was very that was very thoughtful and um, that was very nice of them so that was a really nice experience at the same place <laughs> great mashallah so have you um obviously you live in saudi arabia um for me personally sometimes like people when they see me with my car they'll say oh, i've been asked before am i am i from saudi yeah so you get that sometimes and often especially like you've mentioned before people they say like i'll go back to your country and all these kind of things like a lot of the time people think that because you're covering your face you must be from saudi and this is even from some muslims i've experienced this as well you know they assume okay, that okay. they assume okay. that i'm not from like the uk because i'm wearing the niqab okay i've experienced that personally so um oh, okay, okay. yeah like do you um do you know anybody that's living in Saudi Arabia? Like, have you met any sisters who are forced to wear the niqab? Or have you met any sisters who 
do want to wear it, but they have been prevented from wearing it. Because I know that in Saudi, like it's very common that sisters usually cover their faces and it's like a cultural thing as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to say that, you know, there must, you know, there must be, you know, like people here that mm -hmm. are forced, you know, mm -hmm. especially the younger generation, they mm -hmm. want the freedom, they want to, they, they don't want their religion. Um, you know, there really is a lack of belief, you know, in some of the, the younger generations mm. and, and, of course, must be, must be the older generations as well. But, um, uh, and I'm, I'm actually living in a very conservative town okay. where almost everybody wears niqab. Um, the only people that when they take it off is like when they go to the, the main city, Jeddah, mm. shopping, or family visit, they will take off the niqab. But generally inside the city, they, they wear their niqab. So, you know, there, there's a segment here, you know, of the, you know, younger generation that probably are forced, let's mm. say. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a cultural thing. And, and fa those family issues, I mean, here now in Saudi Arabia, it's not a legal requirement for women to cover their face. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, it's just um, a, a part of the life here. And I've, I've uh, discussed, you know, the, the topic of, of freedom and yeah. you know, and how that can protect, you know, the the, the rights um, of you know the society and citizens in particular. Um, but that's another issue anyway. Um, as for in uh, have people ever like in Australia? Yeah, I remember there was one lady. She used to wear a barb, um, but when she got married. Her husband forbade her from wearing it. Or she oh, it oh well, well. Well, it goes it goes both ways. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, I remember um, meeting a, a sister from Saudi Arabia. I was doing an English course, and um, basically, she when I met her, like I was I was wearing a cob. So, and she said to me, "Oh, yeah." I love my country better than this country because in my country the women they have to wear a buyer but in this country the women they just wear anything and she was sitting there and she had a scarf on and she was wearing like tight jeans and a jumper and I just thought well you could still wear a buyer here if you wanted to wear a buyer <laughs> you know but yeah. like obviously for her it was a cultural thing and at those times I didn't really know much about it's not kind of the rules and the cultural elements of like being mm. in Saudi Arabia because I've never um, I hadn't really met many sisters from Saudi Arabia and the, I had a close friend from Saudi Arabia but she and she was um, martial arts, she used to wear niqab and everything but apart from her I hadn't met other sisters really to have like that much interaction with them so I didn't want to assume that everybody's like exactly like how my friend was you know what I mean so that was quite yeah. strange for me as well like when she said that cause I just thought well you know you can still wear a buy in England you can wear what you want but she'd obviously chosen to not wear that you buy a hair, but then she said that's the reason why she prefers her country because you have to wear it over there. So I thought that was strange. Like it's like almost preferring that you're forced to wear it rather than just being free to choose to wear it for the sake of your religion. Yeah. So that this is just ignorance, you know, yeah. like some people they're just not aware, like, you know, they think that they have to. And well, sometimes people are too overwhelmed with um, self consciousness. Mm. That they feel that they have to, you know, fit in. Yeah. So, whereas, you know, to, I mean, to win a club in a non Muslim country, you have to go beyond, you know, self consciousness. That's when, you know, that, that's when you have to, you know, this is when you become God conscious. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm. Oh, well. So, sister, um, what does the niqab mean to you? It means. To me, modesty. Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's just you know, I was, you know um, it is an element of modesty mm. um, within the society. I mean, when I first started, before I started growing up, I'm living with my family. Of course, they're non-Muslims. Men are coming in and out, in and out of the house. I'm covering my, you know, I'm wearing my abaya or my abaya, um, and just with a scarf. And the men, they're coming up, they're talking, they're chatting. It's like there, there was nothing. And, and with, uh, with no disrespect to my Muslim um, brothers, um, that was also happening in the Muslim society as mm. well. So they're chatting, they feel happy to chat with me. And, oh, how are you going? And what are you doing? And, you know, where are you from? And, um, 
it was, it was very easy for them to come and chat and be friends and um, and I feel that this is this is not you know what my religion is teaching me that I should be friends with all of these people and smiling and chatting and you know, this is, you know um, it's against what I was being taught about my religion about you know the, the women being modest except with her husband and her family and mm. so when I started when I made that decision I, and um, based on knowledge, when I made the decision to wear the niqab based on knowledge, um, I felt I got respect. I felt now I was being respected. And that's by the non-Muslim and the Muslim. The non-Muslims, when they come and visit, they give me my space. Mm -hmm. They won't come and sit and chat with me. Like, you know, just having a, come and having a beer, having a drink, like, like they are with their friends. They will give me this respect. Muslims as well, they would lower their gaze, they would step back, they would make way. I felt, I felt this level of respect that just wasn't there before. It was okay. amazing. Um, and, but one of the greatest benefits that I have found from wearing niqab is I feel that my heart was clean. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't about wearing niqab, this is about lowering the gaze. Mm. Because if we're sitting and watching movies on, on or say videos, lectures, even if you're there, um, you're sitting, you're watching lectures, you're, 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 seeing, you're seeing people and when those people are around you in your society, sometimes our heart gets detached. This is shaitan, this is mm. a natural thing. We're used to, um, uh, for example, before I was Muslim, uh, there would be a, a gathering, um, you know, uh, me and a partner, and another couple uh, and you know your partner and you know what's going on and you know it's all the pitfalls with them mm -hmm. and then you see this other person oh they're perfect oh, shaitan's making them look perfect to you you know so your heart starts inclining to them of course yeah and, and there's nothing there's nothing there's no touch there's no conversation this is just in the mind this mm. is just this so this happens between men and, men and women. This is just a natural part of our makeup uh, and that this is our test that Shaitan has the ability to, you know, to, to whisper like this. But when you cut that off, you wear naqab, you lower your gaze, you don't carry on, you know, chatty conversations with, these, with other people, with other men, people of the opposite sex, then this protects your heart. You don't have these whispers come in and say, oh, look how nice this one is and my husband's like this and you see. Yeah. So I, I really felt that this was one of the greatest benefits um, was the purity and, um, you know, the cleanliness of, of my heart after that. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Sister, I wanted to ask you actually, I wanted to go back to asking you about your course that you're studying. You said you're doing digital design. What made you want to get into that? I've been looking for work over here in Saudi Arabia for quite some time and I found it quite difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the only work I was actually able to get was, um, and this is Qadr Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I had have had everything that I have wanted in, in, in this life, I'd probably be out shopping and wearing nice clothes mm -hmm. and have a house full of lovely things. <laughs> but Allah has decreed for me something else. So mm -hmm. I ended up studying Islamic religious studies, okay. basic studies. Um, so I ended up finding work at the local Dawa Centre, mm -hmm. a very, you know, a humble wage, alhamdulillah. Um, so I've always been looking for work. So if I had a good income, I could give more sadaqah, I could do more in the field mm. of Dawa. Um, but I, I was never able to find work recently. The Dawa Centre has um, closed down the female sections. Oh, the right. female sections of the, um, they're trying to Americanise country which means you know I get rid of most of um, those things like that anyway get, mm. get rid of most of the, the education centers um, many education Islamic education mm. centers have been closed down except main universities the Tahfid centers are still running um, so yeah so needing work so I decided to do digital design because that's something I just really enjoy Alhamdulillah Mashallah. So obviously that's online as well. Yeah, that's online from Australia. So I'm okay. From Australia. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Alhamdulillah. So you get get good contacts from Australia as well with the course. I take it. 
uh, yeah, contact. I don't know where I, I interact with the students and yeah. You know. Oh, that's great. inshallah. May Allah put barakah in it for you, sister. I mean, I mean, yeah. Yeah, and of course, I have all my you know, my friends. Over the years I spent in Australia, many of the uh, new converts and friends I have back there. So it's nice to go and see them occasionally as well. Alhamdulillah. So, do you do any like? Um, obviously, you said you studied at Islamic. Um, you did some Islamic studies and stuff like that. Do you do like lectures or some type of lessons for other sisters? Uh, when I was working for the Dawah Centre, yeah, I used to give the Islamic okay. uh, the lessons, teaching new Muslims mostly. mostly. Um, before it closed down, we sort of felt that they were going to start closing things down. Mm -hmm. um, and at that stage, um, I started putting my lessons onto, a, onto YouTube. Right, so I started okay. making audio videos and, and so that's where I spend most of my time, my time you know, teaching uh, others just through, through videos, uh, sometimes topics which come up, sometimes curriculum, trying to mm. get everything that I have done onto the website, it's taking time. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, so you, you've got a website and also a YouTube channel? Uh, yes, yeah, it's okay. just a basic WordPress, WordPress okay. website just to collate all of the lessons together in one easy, one easy place. Okay, and you're still so teaching now? Channel up. Um, I do lessons. So I, the only thing I'm doing now is uh, is creating the videos, right, and okay. then uploading them, and then sharing them amongst the society and in the social media. Okay, inshallah, we'll um, inshallah we'll have the put the link to those in the description for this um, um, interview, so that people can get access if they're interested. Inshallah, they can benefit. Okay. May Allah accept you know the effort that we make to. You know, to share the message and now forgive us for our short on our shortcomings. Amen. Amen. Sorry, sister, to end the interview, can I ask you um what would you advise to any sisters who are thinking um of wearing the naqab? Yeah. Okay, so for sisters that are uh, looking to wear the naqab, I think that you you need to consider your circumstances first. Um if you're in Australia, if you're living with non Muslim family, if you need to work, you're a new Muslim. Um, then you need to really consider because I don't, I don't think it's respectful for yourself or for the naqab itself that people put it on and take it off. Mm. I know I did that uh, and I know people do that, but I think, you know, it should be, you know, a serious commitment and a reasonable commitment. Sometimes we have a tendency to do things just on the spur of the moment without mm. giving it, you know, really deep thought. So people, I think they should think about their circumstance. Are they going to be able to, you know, commit, you know, to that? Um, um, but I think, you know, if Allah has put in your circumstances a way, you know, to wear it, where it's not going to prohibit you from work or, you know, cause a problem with your family. For example, there are some people like in India, they become mm. Muslim families will kill them mm. so in those circumstances they shouldn't even cover their hair they should hide their religion yes probably. um so people need to think about their circumstances um but otherwise I, i'd recommend i really recommend making this move um allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked you know the wives to cover and of course the believers and if we really want to do what pleases allah and you know work to have that really pure heart then i think this is a great step and i would encourage um all sisters to take this step inshallah sister thank you so much for giving your time for us today for the podcast and i've really enjoyed speaking to you and hearing your story but yeah again, it's been a pleasure to be with you thank you yeah, thank you so much jazakallah khair sister assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.